Um, all right, thank you guys for joining. My name is Mark LaMonica. I'm the product manager for Morningstar Premium and Morningstar.com.au. And today we're gonna to talk about SPACs. If you don't know what a SPAC is, hopefully you'll find out. And we'll talk about why they're important too. But first, anything you hear today is general advice. I don't know anything about you, so I can't offer any personal advice. And also, if you are in New Zealand, which we can soon visit, um, if you're in New Zealand, you should go refer to our FAP um, disclosure. So please do that. The other thing is I would like questions. So please ask as many questions as possible. I think it makes it more fun for everyone, um, especially if you don't know what a SPAC is. Well, wait till I describe it, then ask questions. So let's get into this. All right. Here we go. Um, all right, we're going to talk about SPAC. So what does SPAC stand for? And I'm going to say SPAC a lot today. But we also have two special celebrity guests um, today. So that will be exciting. So a SPAC is a special purpose acquisition vehicle. So what is that? Well, basically what that is, is it is a company that has no commercial operations. And it's used to raise money and then acquire other companies. So <clears throat> that's probably a little bit confusing. Um, but we'll get back into what that actually is. But first, we want to go back and look at the stock market in general and what the stock market is for. So obviously, as investors, the stock market is an opportunity for us to take ownership, stakes, and companies, and, uh, and then hopefully um, earn a return on that. But if you are a company, you use the stock market to raise capital. So companies go out and they go to the capital market, so whether that's a debt market where they're issuing bonds or whether it's the stock market and they use it to raise capital, what they'll do is they'll invest that obviously in the company and that will fund ongoing operations, expansion, whatever they want. So companies obviously need to access money. And the way that a private company becomes public is they issue an initial public offering. And that is basically where a small group of owners of a company, then all of a sudden, there can be a larger group of owners of a company and their shares out there in the marketplace, and they are traded. And the money that is paid for those initial shares, the company gets to keep. Now, a company can, of course, go back and access the stock market in the future. They can do a secondary offering. We saw a lot of these in 2020. As companies were trying to raise capital to get through COVID. Um, but generally, all the stuff that happens on the stock market, and of course, companies want their stock price to be high, but generally, it doesn't really benefit the company much at all. Um, Except for those initial raises, so there's a couple. Uh, there's a couple. Um, there's a couple nuances around uh, around raising money, and so we'll go through that process very quickly. So number one, we'll start with uh, we'll start with um, how companies will generally start up. So it can be everything from sort of a friends and family bootstrapping thing where you are uh, just raising capital from people you know to start your business to eventually going out to the various different phases of venture capital um, where you are raising money from private investors and you are still private. But then eventually you do want to go public. And the process for going public um, goes through an investment bank. And there are some issues with this process. And there are some things that companies don't like about it. So basically what an investment bank will do is it will go in and look at your company. It will come up with a valuation for, the, for your company. And it will actually underwrite your company, meaning the investment bank will give you the money that you're eventually going to raise for the company. The investment bank then goes out, does a roadshow, tries to get investors interested in buying the company. It will then price the shares of the company, and you will go public. Now, what generally happens here is that when companies go public, there is a huge bounce in the stock price. And the reason that this happens, well, the, the cynical reason that this happens is because the investment banks, of course, need investors to agree to acquire the shares initially. 
And those investors then own the shares. They're allocated out to a bunch of institutional uh, investors generally. They're allocated out. And then if there's a huge bump, those people profit from it. And the investment banks like that because they're going to do another deal very shortly. And they want investors to come in and buy that because they are actually taking the risk, right? They're taking the risk because they paid the company and they're trying to then sell the company to initial investors at a higher price than they paid the company at. Then they're hoping it bounces as soon as it starts going, as soon as it goes public, so that those investors are happy and will then subscribe to the next deal. So that's the very cynical version of this. And if you're a company, you start to have problems with this stuff happening because at the end of the day, your shares are trading for a way higher level than you got for the comp- uh, for your company to actually invest in the company. So people have some issues with that. Um, so, uh, so anyway, that's the process. So SPACs came along in the late 1990s or maybe the mid 1990s, but they were never really used very much. And what a SPAC is, is an alternate way for companies to go public. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the mechanics of a SPAC. So basically what a SPAC will do is they will have an IPO and that IPO will go out there, get money from investors, but there is no company. So all you are doing as an investor is you are looking at the people that started the SPAC and you're thinking, I think that this person can go out there and find a profitable and good company with this money. So I'm really investing in them because you are investing in nothing. There is no company. The company doesn't do anything. It's literally a shell company. So what you're really investing in is the ability of the management and the board of this SPAC to go out there and acquire a company. So SPACs basically, for all these years that they existed, nobody really cared about them. So um, as I said, they started in the 90s. So if we go back to 2016, $3.2 billion was raised in SPACs meaning that investors put $3.2 billion into a number of different SPACs, thinking that the managers of the SPAC would go out and buy a good company. So that was 2016. 2019, it was $13.6 billion. 2020, it was $82 billion, and it's been $87 billion so far through one quarter in 2021. So lots and lots of people are interested in SPACs. So let's walk through some actual examples. And we did get a question saying, is Berkshire Hathaway a SPAC? It isn't. Um, So the SPAC part of this is the fact that it's different from a holding company that may go out there and acquire other companies because it's a real company. If you think about how Berkshire started, so Berkshire started and the Berkshire Hathaway is a textile company that has long since shuttered all operations in New England that Buffett bought back in the 60s. So he bought a textile company, textile company that were closing plants, selling off assets. He was generating cash there. He bought an insurance company. Insurance companies are notorious for kicking off a lot of cash, right? There's a float in between when you pay your insurance. Like if you pay life insurance, there's a float for you pay your life insurance and then you die some years later. So that's why Buffett really likes insurance companies. But that's how that's how Berkshire Hathaway started. It was always a real company. Um, now, he goes out there and acquires a lot of companies, but also there's just a lot of operating profit in there from the companies they have. So, um, so no, it is uh, Berkshire Hathaway is not a SPAC. So let's go through some examples of SPACs. And we'll start with me being a little bit cynical. We have one other question. Is term SPAC a terminology of Morningstar? Is it a common term in the investment share market industry? Yeah, it's a, uh, it is not Morningstar terminology. SPACs are a real thing. That's what they're called. So it serves, as you can read on the screen, special purpose acquisition vehicle. Okay, now it's time for our celebrities. And so this will be a little tongue in cheek eventually. Then I'll go through some real examples, SPACs. All right. So we've got this quote from Jim Cramer. Um, So if anyone's ever watched CNBC, he is a crazy man. Um, But but a lot of celebrities have gotten involved in SPACs. So we have two celebrities here. The guy on the left is A-Rod. So I don't like A-Rod very much because I like a different baseball fan, a different baseball team. A-Rod is known for being very egotistical. He's also known for getting kicked out of baseball for using steroids. But that's A-Rod in a very famous picture of him kissing his reflection in a mirror, um, which is interesting. So he's the CEO of a SPAC called Slam SPAC, which raised $575 million. Then we have Shaq. 
So Shaq is a strategic advisor to a SPAC named Forest Road Acquisition Corp. Um, and, uh, and this is my favorite Shaq quote. Um, I can't end my messages with Love Shack because the B-52s ruined that for me. So if anyone knows the song Love Shack, you, uh, you will get that quote. Um, the reason I wanted to put these guys up there, and then we'll talk about a real, uh, some real SPAC, well, these are real SPACs, is because celebrities and all sorts of people have jumped on the bandwagon. So if you ever think that something's about to crash, or if there's ever a sign something's about to crash, it's when there's a Shack SPAC and A-Rod's involved in the SPAC and the CEO. A-Ride also, for people that are less U.S. sport fans and more into pop culture, A-Rod is engaged to J-Lo. And um, Shawnee really likes this quote. He once called her the octopus because she was so good at so many different things. Um, I think we were supposed to equate the legs of an octopus with her talents at many different things. Um, but anyway... We've also got a picture of this helicopter because I think this is one of the most ridiculous SPACs. So this is Joby Aviation. So Joby Aviation is a, uh, is a company that wants to start commercial operations of a helicopter taxi. Um, and they went public through a SPAC. Value the company at $6.6 .6 billion. Now, they have no commercial operations. They're hoping in the next couple of years that maybe they can start some commercial operations. They have no flying taxi, so they have not developed a flying taxi yet. They don't have any certification. They're in the US. They have no certification from the FAA, the Federal Aviation Authority, to actually fly a taxi around. Um, and they have not started building their factory yet where they will make these helicopters that may or may not be legal to fly around and that don't exist yet. But they raised $6.6 .6 billion. Interesting. But anyway, let's talk about let's talk about SPACs from an investor standpoint. And I'll tell you why you should care later. So why do you invest in a SPAC? Well, if you invest in a SPAC, as I said, you own shares in a company that has no commercial operations. And the rules behind SPAC specify that the investors, whoever owns it, A-Rod, for example, for his, they have two years, or the management of the company have two years to find an investment. If they don't find an investment, they have to give you your money back. So as an investor, what you're hoping, or what you traditionally hoped, was that the SPAC would go out there, find a great company to acquire. So we're talking private companies here. They'd find a great private company to acquire, and um, then would run the company, and it would become a great company, right? It's like investing in an IPO when you don't know what the IPO is. Um, so how, of course, you make money is you make money the same way that, well, generally, the way you used to make money is you made money um, as a, any investor would, that you know, the company eventually starts growing and it's a great company and you know, everything else that, uh, that leads to making money as an investor. Now, what has actually happened, and the reason we're talking about SPACs, which we'll get into, is because of how speculative everything has been been going. We talked about GameStop on a former one. Um, we've talked about buy now, pay later shares. We've talked about all these different examples. SPACs is probably the best example of how ridiculous and speculative the investment markets are getting. So now SPACs are, are increasing in price well before anybody ever actually buys a company. So you are literally paying more, and we'll get into a very specific example of this, but you're literally paying more for a shell company than the company has raised um, just because of it's all the same stuff. It's these Reddit boards um, and all these rumors flying around. And that's why we're going to talk about SPACs. So and we'll get into that more. But let's look at a reputable SPAC. Um, no offense to Shaq or A-Rod. Offense intended to A-Rod, because I really do not like him. Um, I'm a Mets fan, by the way. A-Rod was on the Yankees for a long time. And muscle-bound, steroid-taking egomaniacs are pretty much the only players the Yankees get. Um, but one of the biggest SPACs um, that was ever raised is raised by this guy named Bill Ackman. So Bill Ackman's a real investor, a pretty famous investor. So he's a hedge fund manager, founded this hedge fund called Pershing Square Capital. Um, and so, of course, everyone's very excited. And he got raised a lot of money with, uh, with this SPAC. Now, um, 
The interesting thing, and what illustrates how ridiculous SPACs have been, his SPAC, without acquiring a company yet, is up 50%. So people are now paying 50% more than the IPO price for this SPAC, um, which, which is interesting. And it is driven by rumors and speculation, once again, all over the Reddit board. So in, uh, in early February, there was a rumor on Reddit that um, he had chosen a company to purchase. Now, the rumor was false, he didn't, but the shares went up 12% in a couple of days. Um, and the rumor was started because Pershing Square, a different entity that was obviously associated with the same person, was having their annual investor day. And so somebody started a rumor that they were gonna announce what the SPAC had inquire, acquired, even though it had nothing to do with Pershing Square. They're literally completely separate entities on this investor day. So yeah, price went up 12%. Um, so basically what we're seeing here is, and SPACs are very easy, we're seeing manipulation. And SPACs are very easy to manipulate because they, um, there just aren't that many shares in them. They're less liquid, they're a lot smaller. So even the biggest one, $4 billion, isn't a lot. That's very different than if we go and look at large companies. Um, and you know all this stuff that's happening on Reddit, by the way, it's important to remember, this would be illegal if a company did this. Um, but obviously as individuals, they can do that. And there's a lot of people that just buy whatever they hear. Um, so I think it's interesting. But let's talk about, so let's talk about what Bill Ackman, a real investor, needs to do now. So he raised $4 billion. Means he can go out there and spend $4 billion plus leverage. He can take on debt um, to acquire a company. But the share price is up 50%. So now basically he needs to find a company that's worth $6 billion for $4 billion, which is, uh, yeah, which is pretty difficult to do. And one of the things that is important to note as well, and we'll talk about IPOs and how many SPACs there are, but we talked about the money they've raised. We now have a ton of money chasing a very specific type of company. Um, so generally what a SPAC would acquire is a, real, is a real company that was making revenue, potentially not profit yet, but was making revenue. And because there's so much competition, number one, it's driving the price up of these private companies that would fit into this mold. And it's making SPAC owners get more and more, or SPAC managers getting more and more aggressive in what they're buying. And that's why I want to use that Joby Aviation. They have no revenue because they don't even have a product, right? They are a flying or a helicopter taxi service that doesn't have a helicopter yet. So they have no customers, they don't have a product. And that's really showing, showing how the standards are being lowered. Now, this happens all the time when businesses are created, but never in this way, right? Generally, you have to make revenue first. You have to, yeah, you'll go out and you'll get VCs or venture capital funding, but generally people are not taking these companies public. That's what's happening now. Um, and you know, we did uh, we recorded a podcast episode earlier today that was talking about looking at some of the lessons of different crashes. But even the companies that came out in the dot com at the end of the dot com era in '99, at least they had some revenue. Um, this is very, very different. It's selling to the public very, very risky companies. Um, so, yeah, you can tell I'm a big fan of. Uh, of SPACs. So let's look at why this matters to us as non-SPAC investor companies. And the other thing that's actually pretty crazy about SPACs is people are buying options on SPACs. So for people that don't know what options are, options are, well, they are a way that you can hedge investments, but you can also take um, you can also take positions that are basically even bigger bets, levered bets in many ways. On, uh, on companies. So basically people that are going out there and buying naked call options means you don't own any of the shares. And if it gets above a certain price, you make a bunch of money. If it does not reach that price, that strike price, you lose all of your money. But people are taking options on SPACs. And yeah, a friend of mine, her dad has decided that he's gonna fund his retirement by buying options on SPACs. Seems like a terrible idea, but what are you gonna do? Um, so why do we care? And we've got this quote right here from Jeremy Grantham. And Jeremy Grantham is a pretty famous uh, fund manager. Um, he runs a company called GMO. Um, so of course the G is Grantham. And he's somewhat retired at this point, but he's pretty famous for calling bubbles. 
Um, and he's been a little early and a little, um, yeah, he's been a little early on a couple of them. Um, but he also called the bottom of the GFC. Um, so, and he's a value investor. And he came out in January, and we did a we did a previous webinar on this. He came out in January, and he talked about how this is one of the most speculative bubbles he's ever seen. And he has this checklist of different things that he looks at in bubbles. And the last part of his checklist is people are doing crazy things. And he talked a lot about how if we look at what's happening with SPACs, it is crazy. And you can see this quote right here. I don't need to read it for you. Um, but he's basically saying at the end of 2020 and into 2021, there has been wild behavior. And it's gotten even more wild from, uh, from when he had that quote. So we can, talk about, we can talk about some of these SPACs. I've got some SPAC data. Um, but let's look at IPOs in general. All right, so these are this is U.S. IPOs per year. So you can see the highest ever amount of IPOs was in 1999, um, which makes sense, right? So that is the that is the start or that is the end of the internet bubble, and of course everybody who had a company that was even remotely associated with um, the internet rushed to push out and go public because markets were so high. And you see this 2000 number as well. And the amazing thing about 2000 is the NASDAQ peaked in March of that year. Um, and then it was a big fall in all of the markets. And nobody wants to go public when markets are falling. So 2000, a lot of these IPOs occurred right at the beginning of the year. And then when the market went into a free fall, of course, people stopped going public. Now, if we go over here in 2020, you can start seeing that once again in the US, they broke 400 in terms of the number of IPOs, um, which, is, which is pretty crazy. So 408, um, uh, I believe, IPOs, or what was it? 406 IPOs in 2020. So far, we are at 407, and we're three months into the year. Um, which is uh, which is interesting, and a lot of these IPOs, not all of them, a lot of these are SPACs. Um, so I believe half of the IPOs in 2020 were SPACs. It's a higher percentage in 2021, and so what this has created is we've got the situation now where there are 408 SPACs that have not acquired a company, and trust me, they want to acquire a company. They do not want to give the money back. To investors. So 408 SPACs, they have $131 billion in cash um, to go out there and try to acquire companies. And that's just the situation we're facing right now. And so the reason, as I was saying before, that we should care about SPACs, even if we would never invest in them, and even if we think they are way too speculative for anything we would ever do, is that this type of behavior could be an indication that the market is well, in a bubble and potentially is about to drop. So back our friend Jeremy Grantham actually came out, and a lot of people talk about valuations. He actually came out and said when he thought this was going to happen, um, and he was saying late uh, spring, so he's in the Northern Hemisphere, so late spring, so I think May, um, or early summer, so June, July, that's when he thinks that um, that the market's actually going to peak and stop falling. So that is uh, that's that's a spec. Um, we'll go through some of uh, we'll go through some of the uh, some of the questions on here, and uh, and then yeah, we can talk more about sort of speculation and everything else. So we've got we've got a question from Wayne saying, are institutional buyers also buying into these spacs? Yes, they are. So hedge funds are buying into these spacs now. Um, they are generally, and obviously I can't speak for all of them, flipping them as soon as they buy into them. So once again, you always have this, you always have this problem as a retail investor um, that it is hard to get access to any sort of IPO. So right, allocations will be given to, to brokerage, uh, to retail brokerage, and so you can put in a request for an IPO. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's pretty difficult to get it at the end of the day, um, at least the allocation you want as an individual investor. But investment banks are more than happy, obviously, to deal with institutional investors like hedge funds. And so once again, what the hedge funds are doing is they are profiting off of this bounce that SPACs are getting before they even acquire anybody. And it makes no sense. 
right? It really makes zero sense. But the average SPAC is trading at a 20% valuation to the amount of money that they raise. Um, so yeah, those are some of the those are some of the institutional investors that that are getting into them. Um, obviously, there isn't a lot of transparency in the hedge fund holdings, um, but people. Sp- speculate that most of them are just selling these things off immediately. So as soon as they get a little bit of a bounce, they kind of consider it free money. Um, they, uh, they sell these things off. Um, so we've got a question from Martin saying, isn't this type of company SPAC banned in Australia? And is that a good thing? Yeah, no, they are not. Uh, as far as I know, they are not in Australia. I think it's a good thing. I think the thing that we need to be careful about is that as investors, no matter what kind of investor we are, um, as investors, when a bubble pops, um, even if we're not on the speculative end of it, it does tend to panic the whole market and will impact everything. So, you know, if we talk about, uh, so what was it? I'm, I'm forgetting the numbers now, but if we go back and we look at 2000, what happened is, yeah, the NASDAQ was trading at something like 200 times earnings. And that was crazy. But a lot of people sat there and they thought, okay, well, I'm not touching any of that stuff. So it doesn't matter. I'm investing from a US perspective and more blue chip stocks in the S&P 500. Um, why would any of this stuff matter? And yeah, the NASDAQ went down something like 78% or something like that, but the S&P went down 40%. Um, so we just have to be very careful as investors that when these bubbles pop, um, it takes everything down with it. Um, so And valuations are stretched all over the place. They're not as stretched as things like SPACs, but uh, but that's something that's uh, that's important to uh, to take into note. So Randall has got that question: Why does a SPAC or what impact does a SPAC have on the general market, and could it impact on a more conservative investor? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think I think what generally happens is there can be panics in certain parts of the market that then continue to spread, um, and particularly particularly with retail investors. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying there's a lot of problems with institutional investors, but one of the problems, especially in a market, we'll take a step back. In every single market bubble, um, there is generally right at the end a huge surge of interest from retail individual investors. And generally, that is people that have never invested before. So we looked at, when we did this podcast this morning, that will come out in a couple of weeks, we looked at two different crashes. So the Nifty 50 crash, which happened in the early 70s in the US, and we looked at this dot-com crash. In both cases, huge, huge um, retail investor inflows right at the top of the market. So yeah, I think in the nifty 50, we're looking at sort of the 60s, um, that from a fund perspective, that in the first five years, so 60 to 65, fund um, AUM or funds under management, whatever we want to call it, um, doubled, it doubled again from 65 to 70. And then the highest it ever was until years later was 72. And that's when the market crashed. Same thing with dot-com, um, you know, 200, I think $260 billion globally went into US equities in 2000. And remember the market peaked in March. Um, so that's what I think the worry that we have is there's a lot of retail investors and there's enough. And retail investors have become a larger and larger part of the market during COVID, during 2020. And there's enough people in there that are not just invested in SPACs. This is not their entire portfolio. Um, and so, you know, you do obviously get this herd effect um, on the way up, which is what we're seeing now. And you also get it on the way down. So um, that's the thing that I guess as a, um, as a more conservative investor that you should be concerned about. Now, there are good things about this. Um, and one of the things that we said on this podcast today was, um, you know, now is the time, at least in my opinion, to start making a list of the great companies you want to own. Um, because if they do go on sale, if there is a market plunge, you have the opportunity to pick up those great companies for, uh, for a deal. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's likely that any sort of panic in even these most speculative um, investments could impact the rest of the market. All right, got a couple other questions. Sent through anything else you have? Oh, these are just comments. Uh, somebody laughed. Hopefully not at me, um, <laughs> but that's but that's good. Um, yeah. So let's see what else. Uh, 
we're not getting that many questions. So this might be another early one for you, Will. Um, yeah, so, okay, this is, a, we have a good comment. Is it possible to do a webinar on great companies to own? Um, yeah, so maybe, why don't we talk about great companies for a second? Um, and then we can do a separate webinar on that. Um, try to remember this since, you know, I can't remember anything. Um, so let's talk about what we consider at Morningstar and what a lot of people may have different opinions about what they are. What is a great company? Um, and we can and we can contrast this with SPACs, um, for example. So what do we think a great company is? We think a great company is a company with a moat. So what does a moat mean? So moat is a term that was popularized by Warren Buffett. Um, and a moat is a sustainable competitive advantage. So what that simply means, if we step back and we sort of look at how capitalism works in general, um, the way that it works is you come up with an idea, you have a new product, and then basically everyone tries to copy you. Um, so as soon as somebody sees you doing well with something, you try to copy them. We saw that with SPACs. SPACs got popular. Now A-Rod has a SPAC, right? So everybody wants to uh, everybody wants to copy you. Now, as a consumer, that's pretty good, right? Because the more people that go out there and compete, the better it is for you. Because number one, they'll try to beat the competition with better products. And you benefit from that, from having a better product. And they'll also, of course, compete on price. And you benefit from that as a consumer, because prices get cheaper. Now, the thing that protects that with some companies is a moat. So is this sustainable competitive advantage? So what that's protecting for a company is it's pr uh, protecting market share and it's protecting profit margins. Um, so if you, if a company cannot compete with you, then you, uh, then of course you can maintain those profit margins and market share um, and sort of fend off the competition. And at Morningstar, we believe there are five different sources of moats. And I won't go through them all, um, but I can I can give a couple examples. Um, so uh, one example of a moat, of course, there are legal moats. So that would be anything that has a patent, right? If you are a pharmaceutical company and you have a patent to sell a drug, it means literally nobody can copy the drug. They may be able to copy the drug really easily, but for a set amount of time, they can't copy the drug. That is an example of a moat. Another moat can be size, right? That if nobody can compete with you because you are too big and you, uh, and you have a cost advantage over them, um, you're able to manufacture stuff cheaper, which means you can basically put anyone out of business or make it very difficult for them to go into the business because you can manufacture goods for cheaper. Network effect is another moat. So network effect is something, uh, moat source, network effect is something that has a um, increased value as more people use it. Um, and the example we always use is social media, um, right? So like Facebook's not much fun if there's nobody else on it, um, since the whole point is sharing stuff and being social. Um, that's an example of something that becomes more um, valuable to consumers and advertisers, if we take a look at Facebook, the more people that are on it. So network effect. Um, what else do we have? There can be moats around um, if a company is in a very niche industry um, and there really isn't any point in somebody coming in and competing. So if we go back and look at pharmaceuticals, there are diseases that just not a lot of people get, which is a good thing. And so people who make equipment or drugs to help with that disease, people aren't going to spend a lot of money researching new drugs to do that um, because there just isn't a big enough market because not enough people get it. So those are all, uh, so those are all examples of um, moats. So when we're talking about great companies, that's what we mean, that we want them to have the sustainable competitive advantage. And that's what Buffett's looking for. Um, so there's a little evolution of his... Uh, of, um, of his investment philosophy from being a very, very um, strict value investor to evolving into more of this great companies at compelling prices approach. And that's, uh, that's what we're talking about. So I'll show you. So we, we go through, our analysts go through, and they, uh, and they rate companies. Um, and they give a moat rating on the company. So if I go to investment filters, I'll show you guys an example. All right, so if I go into stocks, one of our ratings, so we have all these different categories, blah, blah, blah. If I go into um, 
if I go into quality, so what's a quality company? We have these three ratings, wide, narrow, none. So there's that refers to a moat. We think a wide moat is a company that has a sustainable competitive advantage for 20 years, narrow 10 years. And then of course, no moat companies, we don't believe they do. Um, so you can go through and screen for, uh, for those companies. So if we wanna look at just Australia, wide moat, See the banks are on here, but you can see what our analysts believe. There you go. Um, so yeah, why does uh, so we can go through? We're not going to go through each one of these. Um, but if you go uh, if you go and look at some of these uh, some of these companies, why do we believe the ASX has a wide moat? Well, there aren't any other stock exchanges in Australia. Um, same thing. Airports. There's one airport in Auckland, um, and so that's another example where you can have. A, uh, a regulator that um, basically gives you a wide moat by not letting there be other airports, for example. So you can go through and, of course, read any one of our research reports um, and see why we think um, each one of these companies has a wide moat. You know, if we go into uh, if we go into Transurban, of course, they in many cases have uh, monopoly monopolies on some of the toll roads and have toll roads that literally cannot be replicated. So you can go through and read why we think they have moats. Here's a whole section. So in this case, Adrian, one of our analysts here in Sydney, writes on why he believes Transurban has a moat because they have unique assets that can't be replicated. Now um, that is uh, that's just an example as. Uh, um, of moats. Oh, so we've got a question now on A2 Milk. A2 Milk has not done well lately, but it's up a little bit the last couple of weeks. Um, so we believe A2 has a narrow moat. Um, so once again, you can go and read why Adam believes that, uh, that A2 Milk has a, uh, has a narrow moat. Um, so he's saying intangible assets. Um, so a tangible, intangible asset is, in this case, he's talking about the brand. So an intangible asset, if you think of a balance sheet, a tangible asset is something that can go on the balance sheet. Like you own a building, there it is sitting on the balance sheet. Intangible is something that we can't actually value and measure um, like a brand. So he's saying A2 Milk and brand is another is another moat. So companies build up brands over time. Um, they can uh, They can establish a moat. All right. So what else do we have? Somebody asked if you can short a SPAC. Um, yeah, I mean, technically, you can certainly short a SPAC. Um, I don't exactly know. Um, so shorting, of course, is when you borrow shares and then sell them. Um, so you're borrowing shares from another owner and, uh, and then you immediately sell them. And so when you short a company, you're hoping for it to fall because at a certain point, you're gonna have to buy back those shares and give them back to the person. But if I borrowed shares and sold them for a hundred bucks and then they fell to 50 bucks, I could buy them back and give them back to the person that I, um, and this is not literally, you're not going up to your mate and borrowing your shares, um, but this is the mechanism. You go back to the person or the entity that was holding those shares and you just give them back and you made 50 bucks, right? Because it fell sold them for 100, bought it for 50. So yeah, I assume you can short uh, SPACs, but, uh, but that is a good question. All right. Um, yeah, so Terry, the other parts of your question about A2 Milk, um, I would suggest you go in and read Adam's, uh, yeah, Adam's report on that. Um, so yeah, there have been issues uh, with China. So of course, A2 Milk sold a lot of, uh, a lot of formula um, specifically into China, um, certainly with concerns there about food safety, um, and there have been some issues around it. Um, so um, go in and read Adam's report. We do like A2 Milk. Um, so A2 Milk is on our global best ideas list. I'll show you where that is. Um, which is a monthly list that our analysts put out of their favorite or their best ideas. Name says it all. So if I go into security type, there's all right. So the tricky thing about global best ideas. So even though even though it's the only tricky thing about A2 Milk. So even though A2 Milk trades in Australia as well, we have it listed under New Zealand, um, but it's somewhere in here. There it is, A2 Milk. Um, so it is on our best ideas list. You can read the rationale that uh, that Adam has there, and uh, and yeah, you can uh, you can read up on that. Um, 
All right, what else do we have? Uh, okay, so from the anonymous attendee, do you think the Australian share market is overvalued at the moment? So nobody should care what I think, but I'll tell you what our analysts think. Um, oh, that one woke Shani up. Oh, you look very serious. I'm slightly bored over there. Um, so what I'm showing now is on our monitor markets, um, this is the price to fair value of every stock that we cover in Australia. So what that means is our analysts calculate a fair value for every stock that they cover. Um, that fair value represents what they believe the company is worth. And we compare that to the price. So if the fair value of what we think a company is worth is below the price, um, then that is uh, not a good thing, right? That means the market's overvalued. So simple math, we're dividing that price by the fair value. So anything above one means that we believe the market or the stock, if we're looking at an individual stock, is overvalued. One means we think it's fairly valued. And then anything negative or anything below one we think is, um, is undervalued. So if you look at Australia, and this is equal weighted for every stock that we cover. So remember, this is different than the ASX, this is, which is a market, um, market capitalization weighted index, meaning the biggest companies count more. This is equal weighted for all the stocks we cover in Australia. We believe the market right now is 11% overvalued. Um, so that's so that 1.11. If we go back and look at a year ago, now remember the market um, hit a bottom like about a week and a half ago, a year ago, and we thought it was 16% undervalued a year ago. Um, so you can see sort of what has happened during this run-up. So yeah, as a company, we believe the market's overvalued. Um, and yeah, I personally agree with that. But once again, nobody should care what I think. Um, all right. So um, we've got a question from Randall about ESG. Starting to get ESG questions, who knew? So ESG is environmental, social, and governance factors. So basically what that is, is that's evaluating a company based on all of those factors. So are they, and, and, this, and we're saying good in this case, um, is so a company from an environmental perspective doesn't necessarily have to be a company that is helping the environment, but is a company that does not harm the environment much with their just general operations. Um, and then, yeah, when we look at social, that's obviously how are they responding to certain social um, issues. So whether that is gender equality in the workplace, um, whether that's their response to, uh, to minority leadership or hiring, um, that's what we're talking about with social. And then governance is, yeah, what governance mechanisms are in place that protect you as a shareholder. Um, so that can be everything from the rights that you have as a shareholder. So in some cases, companies issue stocks where you have limited rights um, and they protect a minority shareholder, generally a founder's family. Um, and, uh, and any other governance, the board, how the, uh, how the representation on the board, are there a lot of independent directors? There's a lot of different ESG factors. So what um, people are increasingly looking at um, is ESG. And I think, before I get into your question, one really good example of ESG, um, people, people tend to still think that um, ESG just relates to um, exclusion lists. So people that, um, people that do not want to, and it started with religious organizations back in the seventies, religious organizations that do not want to own something they don't believe in. Um, so whether that's alcohol stocks, whether that's defense stocks that are producing weapons, um, that's where it started. It's very different now. And what it's really looking at is, is a company taking into account all of these different factors that are going to influence the company and, um, and the world ultimately. And so if we want to take an ESG perspective, so, um, and this was our analyst, Adam, told me this like three or four months ago, and I thought it was really good. He used to cover Coke when he was in the US. He's an American that moved over here. Um, and he said, you know, a perfect way of looking at ESG is, you know, Coca-Cola needs to be cognizant of what's happening with water resources around the world. Um, and it's not necessarily, I mean, hopefully partially because they want to be good global citizens, but it's also because water is, of course, the key ingredient in their product. Um, so it's very important that they look at some of these issues around water. Um, so that's an example where, you know, what we think ESG has evolved into is, yeah, just makes, uh, makes sense from um, an investing standpoint because you have a board that's looking at the full 
um, spectrum of risks that could impact a company. So yeah, I do think ESG, to answer your question in a very, very long way, I do think ESG can lead to a moat. Um, now, I think it would be spread across those five different moat categories that we have. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really important factor to, uh, to take into account. And it's just showing us as investors that there's more than just financial risk associated with investing in companies. Um, I like this one. Um, anonymous attendee said the US market has been on drugs for the last four years. <laughs> Plus, um, sounds fun, but uh, but anyway, um, and the anonymous attendee here, she is listing as examples, tax cut, trillion dollars from maybe a deliberate misspelling, maybe not, tramp, trillion dollars from tramp, two trillion from Biden, and then two trillion more. Can, the, can, can that keep the market where it is now for at least two more years? Yeah, I... I wish that I knew, um, because as I always joke, if I knew where the market was going, I would be on my boat in Sydney Harbor right now. Um, but uh, but yeah, we'll see. So I, I think a ton, as you pointed out, a lot of things have happened that are very good for the market. So tax cuts, particularly that corporate tax cut um, that, uh, that Trump uh, put through and that Biden, so remember Biden's talking about reversing that. Um, for uh, for his $2 trillion stimulus, as you pointed out. Um, but that tax cut, of course, is very good for businesses. Um, you know, if we look at if we look at corporate profits um, in terms of the margin that people are making, so profit, um, looking at revenue versus profit, this is the highest they've ever been. Um, so a lot of it is, of course, from technology and the ways that companies are getting more efficient, but a lot of it's also things like tax cuts. Um, and then, yeah, all these stimulus, like, all the money that's getting pushed into the economy by governments to try to blunt the impact of COVID. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot. So I don't know if the market can uh, can keep going. The one thing that I would say is generally all this stuff immediately when it's starting to be speculated about or announced is already priced into the market. Um, so just be careful that even if the economic benefits of if Biden's new... Uh, new stimulus package um, passes, that's already priced into the market. It may flow out over the next couple of years and that will, yes, benefit businesses and people, but the stock market will price that in instantly. Um, so you just gotta be careful that um, even if the stimulus goes out for the next couple of years, that doesn't mean the market is going to do the same thing. Um, and we saw that with COVID on the opposite side, right? So the market fell and fell and fell and there was a lot of uncertainty. And then once it kind of became apparent, I don't think anyone knew it was gonna be bad as it was, but once it kind of became apparent that governments were taking this seriously um, and were injecting a lot of money into the market, as was all the central banks, um, market turned around way before economies turned around. Um, so there's still a lot of economic pain. And the same thing happened in the GFC. There's still a lot of economic pain, but markets are already turned the corner. Well, they could do the opposite thing as well. So I would just be careful. I think the, I think the big thing that... Um, the big thing that's been priced in the market, and we've seen it bouncing around a lot, is what's been priced in is interest rates are staying low for, I don't want to say forever, but they're staying low for a very long time. And central banks have said that. And the other thing is that inflation is staying low. So we saw that when there's been upticks, so this happened in February, there's been upticks in yields, um, the market freaked out. Um, particularly around technology stocks. So all I'm saying is that anything, any assumption that's baked into that market that changes, particularly around inflation and uh, and um, interest rate levels, um, that could bring the market down. I'm speculating, obviously, but um, all right. Um, yeah, so we've got a question from Lisa of Alpaca fame. Um, she says, how much of a factor in market movements is speculation? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think we'll go back to the old, uh, we'll go back to the old Ben Graham quote. Um, in the short term, a market is a voting machine, meaning popularity matters. In the long run, it's a weighing machine, meaning, hey, the actual companies you're investing in and how profitable they are matter. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think speculation, speculation is a huge influence on, on market movements. And it's just this cycle of fear and greed, right? And so it's very difficult. Um, like, hey, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was making fun of my friend's father, who's a very nice guy and who I like a lot. Um, 
who's investing in SPACs. And apparently he just made a ton of money on some option in, uh, in a SPAC. And every time you hear that stuff, or Will flashes around his Bitcoin wallet, um, every, time, uh, every time that stuff happens, obviously people have this huge fear of missing out, right? This whole FOMO thing. Um, and that drives markets higher. Um, that if you think everybody around you is making a ton of money, you're going to do the same thing and it's going to get riskier and your investments are going to get riskier, riskier, riskier. And that's why these market bubbles build. And then the same thing happens on the opposite end, um, right? That there's this fear. Everyone thinks that they are, their markets are going to go to zero and they freak out and just more selling contributes to more selling, right? Um, so the same thing happens on both sides. Um, so yeah, that's why I think it's important to look at look at speculative behavior because it's driving people to take risks that they probably shouldn't and uh, and probably wouldn't under normal circumstances. Except for now there's worry the whole world's gonna get rich and they're gonna be left standing there. Um, all right, so we've got a question from Mark. So Mark's looking at uh, Peter Kolchinsky, CEO of Research Alliance Corp, a SPAC, and managing partner of RA Capital Management. Is there a source of reliable info about his tax record? So I have not heard of him. Um, there is a lot of there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of um, information now on SPACs. If you just want to go and look on the internet, I don't particularly have a source for you. Unfortunately, I haven't been. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I've, I've done some research about SPACs in general, but I've never bought a SPAC um, and, and won't. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I think if I don't know Peter or anything about him, um, but yeah, there are certainly SPACs. And the way this started out is genuine. This was, you know, genuine investors um, who were trying to use a mechanism that was attractive for private companies because it was easier for them to go public, right? They didn't have to jump through all these regulatory hoops. Um, they didn't have to go through this process with investment banks, um, where many of them kind of considered that they were getting gypped to the, you know, not not the great um, not the great uh, end of the deal. Um, what I would say is uh, what I would say is the question is can anybody operate effectively in this environment where there's so much capital chasing, as I said, a pretty small population of private companies. Um, so yeah, there's certainly a lot of real investors. I made all my jokes about A-Rod and Shaq and everything else. There are a lot of real investors involved in SPACs. Um, it's just the question is, is this a market environment that anybody could profit in? Um, and sort of the famous, not to keep talking about Warren Buffett, but the famous Buffett uh, partnership, which he started when he got out of Columbia, um, not the country, the, uh, the university, um, is that he ended in 1969. So this nifty 50 run up that was happening during the 60s, he just gave up because he sat there and looked at the market and he was just like, I don't know if it's crazy or I'm crazy, but I can't find anything to buy right now. So I'm giving up and he closed that partnership and he kept one asset, which was a small textile mill in New England, which turned into Berkshire Hathaway. But, um, but yeah, I would just, I would just, I would challenge, the challenge would be anyone who's actually reputable in this SPAC world now how are they finding companies that are being overlooked by everyone else? It's probably very hard when there's a lot of people chasing these same ones. Um, all right, so we've got, we've got another question. So what kind of interest would a SPAC earn currently? Um, yeah, so basically there is this period where a SPAC, of course, has taken in investor money and then is looking for companies to buy. So obviously the money is not sitting under their mattress. They're gonna put it into a bank, some sort of short-term, maybe fixed interest investment. Um, but what kind of interest are they earning? Same kind of interest you're earning, right? So not very much. Um, so you know you don't invest in a SPAC because they've got a slightly higher interest rate on a bank account. You can get your own bank account. Um, but, uh, but oh no. I'll get to this in a second, um, but uh, but yeah, no, a uh, a a SPAC. I wouldn't invest in a SPAC for whatever interest rate they're earning. So Wayne, um, who I used to like, just wrote, "Enjoyed the webinar today, which was nice. Thanks for sharing. Go New York Yankees! Wow. Okay, um, yeah." Okay, cheering for the Yankees is, I don't even know what the analogy we would use. It's like cheering for Darth Vader in Star Wars. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah, okay. Well, I think we're gonna end it on that note. Um, the Mets lost today, which is unfortunate, but, uh, but the Yankees are terrible. Um, and Yankee fans are pretty bad too, no offense, Wayne. Anyway, thank you guys for joining. So we're gonna talk about selecting investments on Tuesday. Um, just seeing if Shawnee will wake up from her nap to uh, to check this for me. Um, I'll just I'll just look myself. How about that? I don't mean to disturb you. Um, so we'll be back on Tuesday selecting investments. So basically, I think Tuesday will be good. So we're going to run through as an investor. We've done this before. We've looked at portfolio construction, and this is the last step of that. So okay, you figured out your goals, your required rate of return. Um, then how do you decide whether you're going to invest in shares or funds? Active or passive strategy, listed or unlisted, so ETFs or funds um, should be should be exciting. We'll see what happens. So, anyway, thank you guys for joining. If anyone has any questions, please email me mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. Thank you. Any advice in this video is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.